and I get the privilege to be able to serve as the lead pastor. If you're a guest, welcome. Today is our fourth and our final week in our study through 2 Peter called Truth and Lies, where we're taking a look at the truth of God's word and we are comparing it to the lies that come from this world. Have you guys enjoyed learning from Peter? Anybody learn, learning from Peter? Yeah. Right, so we just finished 1 Peter in the fall, and now we're finishing 2 Peter. Anybody going to miss Peter? Right, anybody going to miss him? Well, don't miss him too much because he'll be back next week as we start the book of Acts. And the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts is where Peter is the leader of the very first church. So we're going to still get to learn from Peter over the next few months as we get ready to dive into the book of Acts. Well, I do love studying from Peter because outside of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Peter is probably one of the most pivotal figures in all of human history. Here's, here's Peter, right? Peter was the leader of the 12 disciples, later became an apostle. He writes books of the Bible. He's the main character of the first 12 chapters. He's the author or the source material of the book of Mark. Did you know that? That he actually, Mark was his apprentice and he wrote down all of Peter's lessons about Jesus, which became known as the book of Mark. He writes 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He plants the first church. He pastors this little thing known as Christianity. You ever heard of it? It's kind of a big deal. Therefore, Peter is one of the most pivotal people in all of human history. And when we first meet Peter in the gospels, he's a young man, probably in his early 30s. I can say that because I'm about to turn 38, which means he's younger than me, which means he's a young man. And so he's a young man. And then through the book of Acts, he gets a little bit older. Acts spans 30 years of church history. So he gets a little bit older. And then by the time he writes first and second Peter, he's like a grandfather in the faith. He's older, he's wise, he's a little weathered, but he's still got a little pep in his step. And he's writing to the church. And what he's trying to tell the church is that in the midst of the chaos and the confusion and the crazy that's in the world, stand firm and hold on to the truth. He knows that at any moment he is going to be arrested and put to death, which is in fact what happens shortly after writing the book of 2 Peter. He is arrested and he is murdered by Nero. Here's the context of 1 and 2 Peter. He says, the world is on fire. That's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, do not be surprised when you face the fiery trials. The world is on fire. And that prophecy actually came true because Nero literally set Rome on fire, turned around and blamed it on the Christians. Nero, the emperor of Rome, was probably the most wicked, godless, ruthless tyrant in all of modern history. He would actually arrest Christians, have them dipped in pitch and tar, set them on fire so that way he could actually have a little mood lighting for his dinner parties at night. Wow. He murdered Christians, would throw them in coliseums, draw and quarter them, have them women and children fed to lions, little boys fighting gladiators, all for sports. And even in the midst of all this, the largest superpower ever, Rome, was imploding. It was self-destructing. Because of his leadership, you had political infighting. People were rioting in the streets and protesting. You had division happening within the government. But also socially, you saw that there was sexual confusion where homosexuality and transgenderism and the grooming of children through pedophilia was actually commonplace. People would go to temples where they would worship false gods and they would sacrifice their children on altars to these false gods. They would have sex openly in the street or in the temple in the marketplace as a form of act of worship towards these gods as well. And I say that and some of you are like, ooh, that's nasty. I'm so glad we don't do that. But do we? <laughs> do we though? Do we though? No, no. Rome was the prototype for America. Welcome to the United States of Rome. Here in the church, the same way, just as the early church was losing their freedoms, the church in America is even beginning to lose their freedoms as well. You have pastors in Europe who are actually being arrested for preaching the gospel in public. You have other pastors in Canada who are actually having their churches closed because they're not gender affirming. We even see pastors here preaching sermons a little bit more intense than mine, losing their 501c3 nonprofit status. I mean, it was only just a few years ago. I don't know if y'all remember this thing called COVID. Like, do you remember that? When it first happened, people were like, you can't go to church. Close down all the churches. Meanwhile, you can still go to strip clubs. It's as if like, like church is just too dirty. Let's go to strip clubs instead. 
right? And then everybody's like, if you have church, you're a grandma killer. You're a granny killer. It's your fault. Stop the spread. Stop the Christians. Anybody remember that or have we forgotten? They never apologized for it, by the way. They just hope that we forgot about it. I'll let you know, I have not forgot about it though. Right, this is, this is the world that we live in. Freedoms are uh, through government overreach. There's riots in the streets. Okay, instead of temples, we have abortion clinics. We just call it choice. Yeah. We have parades for things that we should be having funerals for. We have people grooming little children for sexualizing them and parents who do it for public affirmation and hashtags on Twitter. And what Paul and Peter is doing, he's riding his church in the midst of all this chaos uh, and confusion. And he says, the world and all of its problems. The world has problems, but the church has the solution. What's the solution to all the world's problems? His name is Jesus, Jesus right? Jesus is the solution to the world's problems. What Peter is saying is the problems out there should not be problems in here. Like we should not be surprised when the world acts like the world, but we should be shocked when the church begins to act like the world. See, the problems out there should not be the problems in here. That we are called to be different, set apart, holy. We are called to be unique and different and other. We are not to be like the world, but we are to be in the world, but we are not of this world. And so Peter's reminding his church to stand firm in the truth or we fall for the lies. And so what we're going to read today is the last words ever recorded from the apostle Peter. Last words. How many of you know last words are very important? Like I remember when my, my grandfather died, me and Ashley got to visit him in the hospital. And those last words as he prayed over us were words we leaned in and we, we listened to. Last words are very important. So what is Peter, what is the last words? What's on his mind right before he, he goes to his death? You know what's on his mind? The soul of the people in his church. The eternal life that hangs in the balance of the people in his church. The most important decision you will ever make is where you will spend eternity. Yeah. And so here's, here's the sermon title today. I always come up with really clever, clever sermon titles. Here, here's my catchy, clever sermon title today. You ready? Does God send people to hell? Wow. Okay. Just wow. try to make it as clear as possible. Ask the question. Yeah. Does God send people to hell? I always come up with really clever ones. Like last week, the sermon was called How to Spot False Teachers. <laughs> the week before that was called Why We Believe in the Bible. The week before that was Are You Sure You're Really Saved? We try to come up with really clever, artsy ones like Does God Send People to Hell? Because it's a question that everybody's asking. And so we believe the Bible has the answer to it. And here's what the Bible says. It says that everyone lives forever. The question is where? Wow. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't care what you've been taught, what you believe, what you think. Here's what the Bible is very clear on, is that everybody lives forever. The question is, is where? That all of us, we have two paths, life, death, heaven, hell, blessings, cursings, truth, and lies. The question is not a matter of will we live forever? The question is where? See, everybody thinks that they are going to live forever, but the reality is, is that everybody in this room is going to die. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's what, that, what, science is proven this, okay? 100% of people who live die. I know you don't think you're going to die, but every single person in this room will die. And so when you die, will you be ready for where you will spend eternity? That's what Peter is writing, because here's the big idea, is life is short, hell is hot, and forever is a long time. So you need to make a decision on where you are going to spend your eternity. And when we teach on this subject of hell, some people in our culture, even those in the church, they're going to push back and say, Pastor, I don't like it when you preach on this subject. I don't like it when you talk about it because it's so unloving. It's so not like Jesus. Okay, well, let's just think about it for a sec. Who was Peter? Peter was the leader of the disciples. He was the first among equals. He was the pastor of the very first church. Peter knows Jesus better than you. Yeah. Okay? And so you're like, let's get to the red letters. Let's get to the red letters. These red letter progressive Christians. What, what does it say in the, the red letters? The red letters. Well, here's what we see in the red letters. Jesus talks about hell twice as often as he talks about heaven. 13% of Jesus' sermons and teachings were on the subject of hell. And he paints a very broad picture of what hell is going to look like. He says it is a place of eternal conscious torment and that there is weeping and gnashing of teeth of outer darkness where the worm never dies and the flame never ends. Like Jesus has some strong words when it comes to the subject of hell. And he says this as a warning because you don't want to go there and he doesn't want anyone to go there. And it's just like gravity. People are like, I don't want to talk about hell. I don't want to think about hell. Listen, it's just like 
like gravity. You can deny it, you can resist it, but you only do so to your own detriment because in the end, gravity always wins. In the end, God always wins as well. And so we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna learn a little bit about does God send people to hell? But before we do, I gotta do a little bit of theology. Okay, here at Redemption, we love theology. We don't shy away from the deeper things of God. We love to study. We love God's word. We love to do a little bit of theology. Here's what we see statistically, is that 75% of Americans believe in heaven. 75%. Now out of that 75%, 95% believe they're gonna go there. That means only 5% of people think that they're going to go to hell. 5% of people, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but here's what they say. How do you get to heaven? Here's what they would say. Uh, amongst research through Ligonier Ministries, they've discovered that the way in which they believe people go to heaven is this, is that by being a good person. You know how you are to be a good person? You have to compare yourself with somebody else. That's the only way you could be a good person, right? Turn to your neighbor and compare yourself to them. You're like, I'm better than you. <laughs> You're like, nope, I, I know what you did last week, all right? I'm married to you, no way, no way. The only way you can be a good person is if you compare yourself to somebody else. But the Bible says we don't compare ourselves to other people, we compare ourselves to Jesus, and compared to Jesus, everybody falls short. Yeah, yeah. Right, Jesus is God's standard, not the lowest common denominator you could think of. All right, so we're not saved by our good works, but rather we're saved by Christ's finished work on the cross. That's how we're saved. But in, in America, there is this growing misunderstanding of eternal life, heaven and hell. So let me give you a, a couple of ways in which uh, Americans tend to think of the afterlife. The first is this idea of atheism which would say there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. When we die, we're dead. We turn into dirt and worm food. As Christians, we reject that. We believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. We believe Jesus is God, third, second member of the Trinity. We reject atheism openly. Number two is this idea of universalism. What that says is there is no such thing as hell and everybody goes to heaven. This is a heresy that has been rejected by the church for 2,000 years. It is growing in popularity here in our nation. But I want you to know something. Like if you believe this, you are a heretic. Right. Okay, go ahead and try that on for a little bit. It doesn't feel good, does it? If we'll take it off and get rid of it. <laughs> right? Universalism is a heresy that has been fought against by the church for thousands of years. The third is this idea of annihilationism. Okay, here's what they would say. That Christians go to heaven, non-Christians cease to exist. This is an idea where some people would pick and choose certain verses from the Bible and they would use it to justify themselves because they believe it is the more compassionate option. And I would just like to say to those, you cannot be more compassionate than God. Wow. And, and they're attempting to find some sort of synthesis between the two. How could a good loving God send people to hell? He wouldn't, therefore God just causes them to cease to exist and only Christians go to heaven forever. I don't hold to this position. I reject this position. And if you hold to this position, you're gonna be really uncomfortable for the rest of the sermon. <laughs> Number four is the idea of Arminianism. Okay, here's what Arminians would teach. Most of you grew up in an Arminius church where they would teach that, that you choose God, therefore you go to heaven. That people who choose God go to heaven. People who don't choose God, they go to hell. That you choose God, then God saves you. That's an Arminius belief. Most of us probably grew up in an Arminian type church. This is an orthodox belief. Many faithful Bible Christians, scholars, pastors, and theologians hold this position, right? You could be a member of redemption and be an Arminianist. Others come from a Calvinist background. And so what is Calvinism? Calvinism say that God chooses who goes to heaven and God chooses who goes to hell. That God chooses you and then you are elect and you go to heaven or you're not and you go to hell. It's kind of like that game, Duck, Duck, Goose, but instead it's like heaven, heaven, hell. Um, so heaven, heaven, hell, heaven, heaven, hell, duck, duck, goose, duck, duck, damn, right? And... <laughs> And they would, say, they would say some people go to heaven based upon God's choice and other people go to hell based upon God's choice. And I'll be honest with you, at different points in my life, I've believed both. You can believe both and you can still be a member of our church. It would be really fun at small group to have that debate, right? <laughs> like the gloves come off this week in small group, come on, right? <laughs> Luckily, we're not having small group this week, so there you go. And, and, and faithful Bible Christians and scholars hold to both positions 
And at one time or the other, I've held to both positions in my life as well. But the more I preach the Bible, the more I go verse by verse, line by line through books, the more I've just really not been satisfied with both answers. I believe the answer is somewhere in the middle, and that's a position known as a miraldism. What is a miraldism? It's single predestination, that God predestines everybody, and only those who repent go to heaven, and those who reject him go to hell. And that God, in his love, desires that everybody would be saved, but also we have a choice to respond or to reject. And listen, here's the idea is this, is God doesn't send people to hell, people send themselves. Is that through their blatant, willful rejection of the truth, through their denial of God's sovereignty and authority and wanting to live independent and autonomously apart from him. In the end, God just gives people what they ask for. If you don't want God in this life, you don't get God in the next one. If you don't want his blessings in this life, you don't get no blessings in the next one. If you reject God in this life, then God will reject you in the next one. Listen, God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves. You say, well, do you have a verse for that? I do. It's 2 Peter chapter 3. Open your Bible and we'll dive in. Somebody asked me, they said, what's the belief that everybody goes to hell? I said, well, we just call that being from Texas, all right? <laughs> the first point that Peter's going to tell his church is this, his life is hard. How many of you are like, duh, like I didn't need a Bible verse to tell me that. I didn't, that's a great sermon, pastor. I'm ready to go to lunch. All right, life is hard. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pass the salsa, right? No, some of you, you've been taught this. You've been saying like, hey, your life is hard. Give your life to Jesus. It's going to get better. And you're like, mm, I think there's more to that. That guy lied to me. That guy lied to me. He said it would just all be singing hymns and, you know, blowing bubbles and, and worshiping Jesus until he came back. It's like, no, it, it got a little tough. It got a little hard. Like, I wish they would have not only given me a Bible, but also given me a cup because sometimes it feels like I'm getting kicked, right? That's how life is sometimes. Peter says, don't be shocked or surprised that life is what? Life is hard. Look what he says here. He says, this is now my second letter I'm writing you, beloved. Circle that word, very important. Both of them, I am stirred up in, for your sincere mind by the way of reminder. That's the whole goal of this series is to stir up our church because we're not sleeping here. God is waking up a sleeping giant. As the world goes woke, the church gets awakened that Peter and I are trying to stir up our church because if you are uncomfortable with these sermons, it's because you've been too comfortable for too long. It's time to get a little bit uncomfortable. And so he's trying to stir us up as he goes on. He says that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets, the commandments of the Lord and our Savior through your apostles. That's the Bible. Knowing, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing, following their own sinful desires. True or false, we are living in the last days. Yeah. It's true. You say, well, pastor, how do you know we're living in the last days? Because the Bible says in the last days, people will mock Christians. In the last days, scoffers will scoff. Now, here in America, the way that we get around it is this, is they will say that Christians are the oppressors and everybody else is just victims. Okay, but globally and historically, that's just not true. Did you know that on a global scale, every single year, 100,000 Christians are murdered for their faith? You say, well, how come I never hear about that? Because that means that one Christian every five minutes is being put to death for believing in Jesus. Like the news couldn't even contain all of the stories of the martyrdoms that are happening around the world. See, the world would like to say Christians are the oppressors and everybody else is the victims. When in reality, historically, Christians are the victims. We just don't make a really big deal about it because we know this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And because of Jesus, we have the victory. But the world, the world will actually tell you this all the time. They will mock you. They will scoff you. They will criticize you. They will ridicule you, true or false. It's just not popular to be a Christian in today's society. Like jump in the comment sections on TikTok and start preaching the gospel. Just see how well that's gonna go for you, right? Preach a sermon series called Truth and Lies and see if you don't get deplatformed on social media a little bit, right? right it's just not popular. It's kind of like the game whenever you're a kid, you're at recess. And remember when everybody would line up and pick their teams? right, you're playing kickball. How many of you, your like biggest fear was that you wouldn't get picked last? You're like, please don't let me get picked last. Is that you? How many of you, like Trevor, were always picked last? (laughs) 
How many of you still have some inner healing you need? Like come front to the altar. We have a prayer ministry. We'd love to be able to pray for you. But, but here's kind of how society works. Like, like every single year, basically all the teams line up. These are called hashtags right, or, 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 or your bio, right? And so you, you put your hashtag in the bio. That's how you pick what team you want to be. It's called virtue signaling and intersectionality. And so we're going to line all this stuff up. And, you know, here's, you know, here's, the, um, here, here's the person with, on his fifth booster still wearing a mask while driving their car. Um, here's the person who believes that the mark of the beast is in the vaccine. They're arguing with each other. Uh, this is Antifa. They get a little ski mask. This is MAGA. They get a nice little red hat. This is the Black Lives Matter. We're going to post their square. This is a person. You got to respect their pronouns. Here's the LGBTQ plus LMNOP people. Uh, and then over here, you know, here's the feminists. Even though they don't know what a woman is, they still claim to be a feminist. Uh, and then there's the Muslim kid in the back. All right, and so everybody's lining up and they're picking their team. I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll put your pronoun in my bio, I'll post your square, I'll use your hashtag. All right, there's our teams. And what happens? The Christian kid is over here in the corner with his WWJD bracelet. Oh, nobody picked me. This is our society. And, and here's, here's where the church has fallen in. It's because the church has tried so long to fit in that they no longer stand out. We've just been so desperate. People like me. People like me. People like me. And our affirmation for people's praise has brought upon disapproval from the Lord. Because if you try to please people, you'll never be able to please God. Listen, God did not have you to be born again so you could fit in. God had you be born again so that way you could stand out. Listen, the world may hate you, but here's what we see. God loves you. The world may hate you, but God loves you. What's the word Peter uses to define you? You're the beloved. You're the beloved. Don't worry about what people say. Worry about what God says. Don't worry about what people think. Worry about what God thinks. Don't worry about what people do. Worry about what God does. It doesn't matter if they call you ignorant or stupid or unintelligent or uneducated or outdated or antiquated or a bigot or a transphobe or a homophobe or rape, whatever they might call you. It doesn't even compare to what God has called you. He said, you are the beloved. I love you. I've chosen you. I've selected you. I've changed you. I have called you, anointed you, appointed you. You are the beloved of God. God, you are the beloved. That is your identity. When the world hates you, take heart knowing this, that God loves you. Yes. Listen, I, I, I want you to understand, when life is hard, dear Christian, remember this. When life is hard, this is as close to hell as you will ever be. But if you're not a Christian, this life is as close to heaven as you will ever get. And I really feel sorry for the world. This is why they scoff at us. This is why they hate us, because they ain't us. Because, because listen, here's their, here's, this, is, this is the closest to heaven they'll ever get. Could you imagine if this is heaven? Yeah. Yeah. Like people ask, why, Byron, why do you talk about like social Marxism and neo-Marxism and intersectionality? Like why are you hitting this really, really hard coming from academia and coming even into our local churches? Here's the reason why. It's because Karl Marx taught that in order to reach heaven or utopia, you have to dismantle all of society and then rebuild it from the ground up. Therefore, you can bring heaven on earth. That is a heresy that has crept into our modern thinking and it needs to be dismantled, not in our society, but in our people's minds and churches. Listen, if this is what, this is what the, the heaven on earth looks like, people are depressed and on anxiety medication, you have disease, you have war, you have famine, you, got, you, you, you have you know, divorce, you have children who are being raised in homes without parents, you got gender confusion, you got sexual confusion, you have grooming of little children, you have transing children, putting on puber, puberty blockers, you got drag shows for kids, you have murder, you got school shootings like you look around the world and you're like this is the best you can imagine this is hell it's just the first level and then you get even go further down and get worse listen if you're if you're if you're not a christian i love you and i'm so glad you're here but you need to listen to me right now you have a choice life death heaven hell and right now you're standing in the middle and today is the day God has brought you here to make the most important decision of your life. Wow. What are you going to do when you die? We all have a choice to make. And he says, life is hard. Yeah. But if you're a Christian, it's as close to hell as you'll ever get. And then you get heaven. If you're a non-Christian, it's as close to heaven as you'll ever get. And it gets worse. And the second thing he says is God is good. Look what he says next. 
they will say, where is this promise of the coming? Right now, some of you are like, yeah, Byron, I don't believe you. Jesus coming back, death, afterlife, eternal life, I don't really believe you. What proof do you have? He says, for since the fathers fell asleep, all these things continued since the very beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact. Here's what you have to do. You have to walk around with your eyes closed and your ears plugged up. I'm not looking, I'm not paying attention. I'm not, I'm just, oh, nope, 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 nope. You're deliberately overlooking this fact. What is the fact, he says? That the heavens existed long ago. They were formed out of water, through water by the word. And by that means, the world existed, was deluged with water and perished. He's talking about Noah. But the same word, the heavens on earth now exist. They're being stored up for fire. The first time God destroyed the world, he destroyed it with a flood. The second time God will destroy the world, he will destroy it with fire. Some people say, Byron, you really believe in a global flood? Yeah, three-fourths of this world is already covered by water. It's not that hard. (laughs) Just add a little bit more. And then the second coming is this, is that it will be destroyed by fire. By the same word, destroyed by fire, being kept up for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. What he's saying is this, everything that goes up must come down. What had a beginning also will have an end. In the same way that God destroyed the world one time, well, it's true to his nature and character to do it again for the second time. And then he says, do not overlook this one fact. What's the word? He calls you the beloved. Do we have anything to fear? No, we're the beloved. You don't have anything to be worried about. You don't have anything to be afraid of. You don't have anything to worry about. There's a word that says maranatha, which means Lord come quickly. All right, some people are like, I just, don't, I, just don't want, I just don't want to die. I'm like, mm, any day now wouldn't be bad for Jesus to come back and set this all on fire. <laughs> like during COVID, I was just like, Maranatha. <laughs> when my daughter's getting to high school, I'm like, Maranatha. <laughs> when they start dating, Maranatha. <laughs> but do not overlook this one fact, beloved. With the Lord, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. He's saying God exists outside of time. Therefore, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. As our church gets more bold and begins to preach more sermons around subjects like this, one of the questions that I get asked often is this, is I just don't believe how a good God could send people to hell. Like, I just don't believe a good loving God would send people to hell. That just doesn't seem loving. I just can't believe in a God who would send people to hell. And my response is, well, when I read the Bible, that's just not what I see either. When I, when I read the Bible, I see a God that is good and gives you every opportunity to repent yes. and to turn and trust in him and to, to change the course of your eternal life. When I, when I read the Bible, I don't read a God who's just up in heaven trying to send people to hell. I believe in a God that has sent his son Jesus trying to get as many people into heaven. Woo! Right, see, I I don't believe that God sends people to hell. I believe that people, through their conscience choices, they actually send themselves. And this is what Peter says. He says right here that God desires that how many should perish? How many? How many again? So I looked it up in the Greek. You know what that word means? None. (laughs) I desire that none shall perish. Do people perish? Yes. Is that God's fault or theirs? It's theirs. God's desire is that all should reach what? repentance, that every single person would come to the saving knowledge of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that they would be forgiven of their sins. They would get a new beginning and they would get to be with him in eternal life forevermore. And that God offers the same choice for all of us, accept Jesus or reject Jesus, but that's not his fault. That is our fault. And that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, heaven, hell, life, death, blessings, curses, truth, and lies. This is why our society right now is trying to get away with binary terms. Because what they're attempting to do is to change the nature and character of God. They're saying that God is non-binary, that everything's on a fluid. They're saying gender is non-binary. Everything is on a spectrum. There is no truth. There is no lies. Everything is somewhere in the middle. And so you get to pick your own. What they are doing is they are suppressing the truth of God and they are trying to erase the nature and character of God because our God is very binary. The Bible is very binary. Truth is very binary. You say, well, I just don't believe in truth. That is a truth statement. Therefore, by saying you don't believe in truth, you're making a true statement. Therefore, you are a liar. Why? Because our reality is binary. And so they're trying to get rid of binary thinking. Everything's somewhere in the middle, right? But God is binary. Heaven, hell, life, death, truth, 
lies. Everybody has a path. Everybody has a choice in which they are to make. And some people hearing this will say, well, God, that just, pastor, that just doesn't seem very loving. I thought God is love. Listen, God is love, but love is not God. Therefore, he sets the terms of love, not you. You cannot be more loving or compassionate than God is. And the number one attribute of the Bible is not the love of God. It's like every woke Christian only knows two verses. God is love and do not judge. And every seed bearing plant is good, right? <laughs> so, so here's the number one attribute of God throughout the whole Bible. You ready? Holiness. God is holy. In eternity future, the heavens when the angels are worshiping, they're not saying God is love, God is love, God is love. They're saying God is what? Holy, holy, holy. Because it is the holiness of God in which all other attributes find their place. Yes. If God was not holy, God could not be loving. And if God was not holy, God could not be just. So love and justice are two sides of the same coin. Love and wrath are two sides of the same coin of God's holiness. Wow. And if you want to experience God's love, then you also need to understand that there is justice attached to it. On, Let me give you an illustration to better help you understand. Let's imagine that your daughter was killed in a drunk driving accident. All right, it makes it personal now, right? And so you go to court and the judge keeps hearing all this theology about God is love and God is love and God is love. And so this judge, you know, he's like, you know what? I want to be a good judge like God. Therefore, I'm going to be really loving and I'm not going to punish people for sins and the crimes they commit. And so now you get to go in front of this good judge who doesn't believe in punishment. And you stand before the judge and the judge says, you know what? Because I'm such a good judge, I'm going to let the guilty go free. No, no penalty needed. No, no payment required. Go ahead and go back to drink it and drive it and live in your life. As, as the parent of that child, would you think what a good loving judge that was? No, what would you say? The injustice. You would be outraged. You would have wrath. Okay, well, just feel that. You murdered God's son. He can have a little wrath too. Everybody's out in the streets going, justice, justice, no justice, no peace. Well, God's up in heaven going, I'll get some justice one day. Where's my justice? Nobody's been sinned against. David says this, every sin that has ever been committed is actually a sin against God. Right. How many sins, how many times has God been sinned against? So you got to understand this is this, is that God is love, yes. But if you do not, if the thing that you love is violated and you do not feel injustice or wrath towards that thing, then you are never truly loving in the first place. Wow. And in order for God to be holy, love and wrath must be simultaneously experienced. Okay, so, so here's what he says for Noah, right? Noah is this. He uses Noah as this illustration. People say, I can't believe that God would destroy the world with the flood. I can't believe that God would say 120 years Noah preached and let everybody get on this ark. Yes. You know, everybody was welcome on the ark. Everybody. Everybody was welcome for 120 years. Noah preached and not a single person responded. They said, oh, man, you know what? I just don't believe rain. Pfft, never, it was not going to rain building a boat in the middle of the desert. You crazy. Until he wasn't. Until the rain started coming. But by then, the door was closed. Their fate was sealed. It was too late. For 120 years, everybody get on the boats. For the last 2,000 years, here's the message of the church. Everybody come to the cross. People say, oh, Christianity is, is, is too inclusive. No, Christianity is, Christianity is very inclusive, right? Anybody can come and become a Christian. But we're also exclusive that only Christians get to make it to heaven. And people say, well, God is just, you know, affirming and welcoming. And God is so tolerant. And God is so, God is so, he, he just uh, celebrates us just as we are, right? And that's a half truth, which is a whole lie. God is welcoming. Anybody can come to him, no matter who you are, where you're at, what you've been through, no matter who your mama is or, or who you voted for. Everybody's welcome to come to Jesus. And he will accept you just as you are. You don't have to clean up to come to Jesus, but when you come to Jesus, Jesus will clean you up. And God will take you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way that he found you. He wants to change you. And so he doesn't just affirm you, he transforms you. There's a difference, right? 
And, and so here's what we need to understand. People think God is, God is tolerant. Listen, my friends, God is not tolerant of sin. God is patient towards sinners. Right. What does he say here? That, that God is not slow as some would count slowness, but he is patient with us so that none shall perish, but that all shall reach repentance. God is not tolerant of sin. You know how I know God is not tolerant of sin? Because he sent Jesus to die for it. If he was just okay with your sin, he would never have sent Jesus. If he was just affirming of your sin, he would never just send Jesus. If he was just welcoming of your sin without changing you of your sin, he never would have sent Jesus in the first place. But God deals with sin by sending Jesus Christ to live the death, to pay the penalty of your sin, to live the life you never could live, to die the death in your place, to overcome it through, through, through his death, burial, and his resurrection. He dealt with sin, died the death of sin. He is not tolerant of sin, but he is patient towards sinners. Patient. God is so patient. He's so patient. Why? Because he wants everybody to reach repentance. What is repentance? Turning from your sins and trusting in Jesus. Repentance is this. Your entire life is heading towards hell. And then you say, oh my gosh, God has been so patient with me. So I'm going to turn now and I'm going to begin to follow Jesus. That's repentance. It's literally to change, to change your direction, to change your thinking, to change your mind. It's repentance. God desires that everybody, and here's the reason why you're here today, because God has been so patient with you, he wants to give you another chance to repent. Come on. Yeah. Right. He's so patient with you. Some of y'all should be dead by now. Yeah. And he's giving you another chance to repent. Some of you, you've destroyed your life, your marriage, your kids. You've destroyed your businesses, your career, your finances. You've made such a mess. You have self-destructed over and over and over again. And God has brought you here through his love, grace, and compassion to give you another moment because he's been so patient with you. But my friends, hear me on this one day. God's patience will run out. You do not live forever on this life, but you will live forever in the next one. Make a decision. God is not tolerant of our sin, but he is patient towards us as sinners. Number one, life is hard. Number two, God is good. Yes. Number three, the end is near. Yeah. Here's how he says next. He says this, but the day of the Lord, when you hear that, that's the second coming of Jesus. Either you die and meet Jesus or Jesus comes back, but either way, we all stand before him. It says that we'll come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and all the works that are done in it will be exposed. Listen, one day Jesus is gonna come back. We don't know when, we just know that he will. If you deny the second coming of Jesus, just so you know, heretic. Yeah. If you claim to know when Jesus is coming back, heretic. <laughs> There's some people who are like, I added up all the dates and I have a prediction. He's coming back on this day. Okay, don't listen to that guy. False teacher. But then there's others who are saying, nah, I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in the second coming. I don't believe in Jesus. It's all going to pan out. Don't worry about it, right? That's also a false teacher as well. Because the Bible is very clear. We don't know when, but we do know that Jesus will return. And then here's what he says. He says, since all these things are soon to be dissolved, what sort of people are you ought to be? You're supposed to live a life of holiness and a life of godliness. Like we know that Jesus is coming back. So what do we do in the meantime? We keep doing what we've been doing, loving people, preaching the gospel, baptizing new believers, raising our kids, getting married, honoring our husband uh, and, and honoring our wife, making some babies, training them up in the way of the Lord so that they will not depart when they get a little bit older. We keep sending missionaries. We keep preaching the Bible. We keep doing what we've been doing and what we're going to continue to do because we don't know when, but we do know that he will. And in the meantime, be holy and live a life of godliness. He goes on and he, he writes this. He says, waiting for the hastening of the coming of our day of our Lord. You know, Jesus only gave us one thing that is yet to be really completed for the second coming. You know what that is? The whole world to hear. Did you know that when you share your faith or when we send missionaries, what, what are we doing? We're hastening the second coming of the Lord. Yeah. Did you know that? That's right. Because when the whole world hears, Jesus says that's when he'll return. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know this? Is that by the year 2025, the Wycliffe Bible Translation Company, they believe that by the year 2025, they will have a Bible translated in every known language Hallelujah. around the world. They're working eagerly and tirelessly to be able to do that. Why? So the whole world can hear. And when the world hears, it will hasten the second coming of Christ. Wow. Yes. What are we supposed to do? Peter says we can hasten the second coming of Christ by continuing to share so that the whole world will be able to hear the message of Jesus. 
Because of this, the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. There's an exclamation point there. It's like, burn, baby, burn. <laughs> so whenever I read this, you know what I think? That's called global warming, God's idea. <laughs> take, take that, Greta Thornburg. Did you see that she just received a doctoral, uh, honorary doctorate from a, from a, from a seminary? A seminary gave her one. But here's what we see. The vision of the future is this. It's all going to burn anyway. <laughs> but according to the promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Listen, this is the lie of progressive Christianity. Here, here's what the lie is. The lie is, is that we can actually progress forward by getting rid of what is older by editing and removing God's word. We can, as a society, progress into a picture of a better future. That we can change the world by our works and our deeds as we get rid of the old. And what we can do is we can make this world better. That's, that's a lie. Here's the reason why. It's so subtle. It's so subtle. If you, if you don't know your Bible, you're going to be trapped and tricked in so many different things. Here's why it's a lie. You, you ready? It's because the point of the Bible and the point of the gospel and the point of Jesus has never been to make you better. It's always been to make things new. Right? Right. Jesus doesn't die on the cross to make you a better version of yourself. No, no, Jesus died on the cross to make you a new creation in Christ Jesus. So everything in the Bible is never about better. It's always about new. Like when you, when you accept Jesus right here, here's what happened. He doesn't just give you a better heart. He gives you a new heart. He doesn't give you a better desire. He gives you new desires. He doesn't give you a better nature. He gives you a new nature. And so the goal is not to get a better earth or a better future or a better planet. The goal is to get a new heavens and a new earth with a resurrected new body. Right? And that's, that's the danger with all this is people think, well, we can save our earth and we can change our bodies. No, that's wrong. That's antithetical to the biblical message of Jesus Christ because Jesus never comes to make anybody better. He always comes to make things new. For behold, Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I make all things new. Yeah. And my, my concern for many of us in 21st century evangelicalism is this, is we want better now, but we don't really want God's new. Wow. Like we think I just get a little bit better, right? I just want a little bit more. I just want a little bit now. And we're gonna miss out on what God has next and what God wants to do that's, that's new. Here, here's what Peter's trying to remind his church in the midst of the pressure and the persecution that they're experiencing. Listen, stop focusing on what is temporary and start focusing on what is eternal. Stop focusing on what is temporary. Like, you know, this life is short. Like you only got a little bit of time here on this planet and the decisions you make today determine the quality of the life that you live for all of eternity. Like some people, they want all of their heaven right now and they're gonna miss out on heaven forever. Like, let me give you an illustration to help you understand this. This comes from another pastor, much smarter than me, but I saw it on YouTube, and so I'm going to steal it. Okay. <laughs> this life, this, this represents your life. And here's the billions of years of your eternal life. Yeah. This is what the Bible says. Just imagine this goes on and on and on forever. Millions and billions and millions of years that you will spend for all of eternity. And this section right here, is the short little time you have on earth. Yeah. Right? And so many people, they live for this little moment that they miss out on everything else. Like, like you're so focused on what you're gonna wear and, and what car you're gonna drive and who you're gonna have sex with and, and who's gonna be elected as the next president. You're so focused on all the different hashtags and trends and all of the opinions of people. And the moment you cross through this line, that's when real living begins. Where are you going to spend eternity? Stop focusing on the temporary things that are going to be dissolved and burned away and they're going to be removed and focus on the things that are eternal, life everlasting, in the kingdom forever. Everybody spends some eternity somewhere. And the decisions you make today determine the quality of eternal life that you experience forevermore. Like when people look at me and they say, pastor, I, I, Christians are crazy. Can you believe the way that they live their lives? 
that they give and that they serve. They get up in the morning and they go to church on their day off. Right? How much do they pay you to be on a team? Nothing. I pay them 10%. It's called a tithe. That's crazy. <laughs> like, I remember when people were like, when me and Ashley first got saved, my friends I was working with, they were like, so how many times a week do y'all have sex? And I was like, we don't. We're Christians now. And so she lives in her apartment and I live in mine. What? You mean y'all aren't, y'all aren't? No, no, no. Why not? Well, because I respect her because I honor God. And as I honor God, I'm respecting her. And so no, no, we, we don't, we, not anymore, not anymore. We don't, we don't do that. No, you're crazy. But when I think about the way the world works, I'm just like, y'all crazy, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, okay, like I get 80 years, if I'm lucky, to make as much of a difference now for all of eternity. Like I know this Second Peter series has really just jacked some of y'all up. I get it. And thank you so much for hanging out with me for four weeks. Thank you. I I know many of you have probably already been offended a little bit and wanted to get up and leave. I I get it. But you've hung with us. And so, but here's what I want to just assure your soul just a little bit with this one thing. That that you're going to go through a little bit of hell right here and you're going to get heaven forever. Like for those of you who are struggling, like, listen, listen, I, I want you to hear my heart as a pastor through this. Like, I know I've talked very openly about the LGBTQ plus and transgenderism and homosexuality. I know there are people in our church who have same-sex attractions and go through gender dysphoria. I know that we have people who are in same-sex marriages. I, I know that we have people who are in this church and you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're dating a non-believer and you're, you're sitting here and you're hearing the truth maybe for the first time or God's opening it up for the first time in a long time and you recognize the entanglement and all of the mess that sin has created in your life. And I know you want this, but right now you're struggling with this. And can I just say something to you? Can I just, can I just tell you something right now? I love you. I love you. But you could go through a little bit of loneliness to experience forever with God. Listen, remember Jesus was a celibate single man. The goal of the Christian life is not to get married and have sex. The goal of Christian life is to be able to love and walk with Jesus until the day you get to spend eternity with Jesus. I'm just trying to tell you. I understand. I, I, I don't understand what it feels like to, to, to say, like, my, my, my body and my brain doesn't match. I, I, I don't know. But I know that Jesus says he will renew our minds and that we will get a resurrected body. And in the eternal kingdom of God, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And can you just hang on for a little bit longer? Can you just hang on for a little bit longer? That's it. This is all we're asking. Just a little bit longer because life is short, but forever is a long time. And the decisions you make today determine the quality of the eternal life that you will have forevermore. You get just a little bit of time on earth. Just a little bit of time. Just hold fast. Live a life of godliness and holiness in just this short amount of time. And I promise you, my friends, you will be forever with him in the kingdom that never, never ends. But... If you want all of heaven now, I don't know what to tell you, man. That's not me. That's you. God doesn't send people to hell. People choose. They send themselves. Life is hard. There's no denying that. God is good. No denying that. The end is near. It's closer today than it was yesterday. It's about 50 minutes closer right now than it was when I started this sermon. (laughs) But the end is near. But take heart because number four, revival is coming. (laughs) Therefore, beloved, since you are awaiting these things, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our, what's the word? Beloved brother, Paul. We're going to learn about Paul in Acts. Wrote to you for the wisdom in him, as he does in all of his other letters, he speaks of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant, unstable twist to their own destruction. That's the lies of our society, as they do with other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of these lawless people and lose your own stability. If you don't know what you believe, you will end up believing anything. If you don't know the scriptures, they will twist the scriptures and you can lose your stability. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever and to the day of eternity. Amen. Shortly after Peter wrote this book, he was arrested. He was brought before Nero and he was condemned to death. They crucified him. But he said, it's not, I'm not worthy to die in the same manner as my Jesus. So I'm going to ask that you crucify me upside down. 
And so Peter went to his death along with thousands of other early Christians. You can buy this book. It's called The Fox's Book of Martyrs. I highly recommend it. And it journals through the deaths of the early church fathers and all of the early church as well. It talks about many, many heroes in the faith, Peter being one of them, crucified upside down. And I want you to think about this. Rome was the largest superpower, the largest military. It was the beginning of the Western civilization. Nero was the emperor. And Peter and his little church, it's just a man and just a small little group of people. And here we are 2,000 years later. And even though Nero killed Peter, Peter still lives on through the church. Peter still lives on through the church. You know, last year, me and Ashley, we got to go to Rome. And I stood, I paid $20 to walk through the ruins. The greatest empire in the world. It's rubble. It's gone. And we stood in a Colosseum. And I just thought about all my brothers and sisters, your spiritual heritage, your legacy that you've received passed down from the saints of old. Your great, 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 great grandparents in the faith. You do know we're all connected, right? And they would murder children and their moms by feeding them to lions and wild dogs. They would have Christians fight gladiators and lions for sport. And they would laugh and they would mock and they would scoff and they would jeer and they would criticize us. And me and Ashley, we stood along with several other missionaries and pastors in the middle of that Colosseum and we opened our Bible and we read the truth about God. And I want to tell you something, my friends. In 2,000 years, no matter what you have been taught, told, believed, or seen, it will all be destroyed. But the word of Jesus Christ will still stand strong and remain. And the church of Jesus Christ, if Jesus don't come back, it will still continue to move forward. And so here's what I want to encourage you with, what Peter's encouraged them with is this. When the culture is at its worst, that's when the church is at its best. When the culture is at its worst, that is when the church is at its best. Like when the the world is its darkest, the church shines the brightest. When the world goes woke, the church, it is awakened. Whenever the truth is being silenced, that is when we speak up even more. When they get loud, we get bold. And when the church is at its worst, that's when we are at its best. When there are people who are hurting, we say we got healing. When there are people who are hopeless, we say we got hope. When there are people who are stressed, depressed, oppressed, possessed, we say we got deliverance for you. We got healing in here. We got salvation in here. We got grace in here. We got freedom in here. We got eternal life in here. We got joy in here. The whole world may be on fire, but we are on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. We got the answer to the world's problems and his name is Jesus and the world needs a church that is willing to stand for the truth because there are so many who are believing and falling for lies.